All right, you got a Bible open with me, please, to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to be uh, 1 Kings 17, 1, and then we'll go into 18. All right, y'all ready? So there was a, a rabbi and a priest that were sitting together on a train. The rabbi leans over and asks the priest, says, so how high can you advance in your organization? And the priest says, well, if I'm lucky, I guess I could become a bishop. And uh, the rabbi says, well, is that as high as you can go? He said, well, you know, there's no way, but maybe I, I could become archbishop. And the priest, you know, he just sort of says it with a grim. And uh, the rabbi says, is that all? Is that as high as you can go? He said, well, yeah, I mean, maybe if all of my works were awesome, I could become a cardinal. And the rabbi says, is that all? Is that, that as high as you can go? He said, all right, well, I guess the top floor is pope. I could become the pope. And, and the rabbi said, really? That's as high as you can go? And the priest looks at him and says, well, any higher than that, I'd have to be the Messiah himself. And the rabbi says, well, one of our boys made it. Oh, y'all ready? Uh, Elijah. We're, we're talking about Elijah today. First Kings chapter 18. Uh, by the way, the Transitions group is not just a life group. It's open to anybody 50 and older. That's this Thursday. We're going to have a blast, so I encourage you to be a part of that. All right, would y'all stand to your feet in honor of God's Word? <coughs> First Kings 18, 21. And this is our verse to start the day. I would uh, like you to read it along with me. Would you read it out loud with me, please? All right. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. I love this verse. I love this verse for a reason. It tells us the necessity we have to make a decision. So, Father, I pray that today, um, you know, God... These kind of messages are not the easiest messages in the world to preach. So I pray that you would please uh, look down on your servant. You would, your, your slave, all right? Let's just be honest. Um, would you give words that are right and appropriate and cause only those things which need to be spoken to be spoken, those things that do not, not to be spoken. And I pray that the truth of your word would call a people to make a decision. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. So have you ever had a moment that tested your spiritual resolve? All right, so I had just uh, made a, a commitment to follow Jesus with all my heart. I went to Bible college and I'm up there and I, it was my sophomore year at the end of the, anyway, you've heard that story. I, I made a decision. I'm coming back to school. I'm going to follow Jesus. And then there's two different ways to follow Jesus in Bible college in those days. One is to do the spiritual thing and go sing songs in churches and be a part of a choir. And they heard me sing and nobody wants me to be a part of a choir. So um, uh, the, the other option was to do the more radical thing like go out street witnessing. So uh, do y'all remember the days? Anybody in the room remember cruising? Has anybody ever cruised in this room? A couple of you old timers cruised. What you would do, all right, listen, this is how stupid it was. You would go out and you would drive down the road, you would turn right, you would drive, make a U turn, go down, drive back, hang a left, go up, make a U turn, go back down, hang a right, go back down, and you just make this L pattern at Greenwood and, yeah, at the, uh, I, uh, um, Grand and Greenwood. That's where we did it for hours. But it was cheaper in a movie, right? Right? So anyway, did anybody ever cruise other than me? Yeah, what a waste of time. Well, all right, so in Springfield, Missouri, where I was in Bible college, people cruised all the time. They cruised over on Kearney, and they would just pull four lanes of cars back to back, sitting slow in traffic, you know, because you can't move because it's all backed up, and you talk and wave. And, and Springfield, Missouri was a little rough. All right, the rednecks... Uh, their neck was a little redder than some other places, the meth capital of the world. It was just a little bit of an a iffy type situation. You know what I'm talking about. This is not the nicest part of town. Anyway, all the rednecks are there. So anyway, I go street witnessing, and I grab a tract, and I walk over to a car, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand them the tract to the driver's side window, and the guy in the passenger seat says, he reaches up and grabs the glove compartment and says, i got a gun in here. I'm going to blow your head off if you come one step closer. Well, I didn't doubt him. He probably had a gun in there. I mean, it, it, anyway. But you know, you ever have a moment, something just sort of comes over you? And it was one of those moments, something just sort of came over me. And I 
walked up to the car, stuck my head inside the window, pushed the track right at the dude and said, all right, you blow my head off. I'm going to heaven. Where are you going to go? I did just one of those dumb moments, you know, what can I say? But it called for a response. And, um, you know, there are showdown. Today we're going to talk about showdown at the Mount Carmel Corral. Now, you got to be old to understand that reference, but showdown at the OK Corral was uh, part of American folklore and history. Uh, but showdown at the Mount Carmel Corral. You know, there, is, there are showdown moments that we have in this life. Yours might be different than maybe sticking your head in a car for some guy saying he's going to shoot you. Uh, maybe yours is, will you go to the bar with everyone after work? You know what's going to happen, but yet, man, that's trouble. How about seeing a loved one get sick and die in front of your eyes and you face the anger and the pain at the injustice of God not healing them? How about access to a computer when no one else is around? You know where that leads. How about seeing a tweet, a comment, or a post, and will you respond? Will you respond with snark or anger or love? How about hearing something about God or the Bible that disturbs you? Will you seek out truth? Or will you make an excuse to not follow God. See, we all have moments, showdowns at the Mount Carmel Corral, happens all the time. Now, a lot of people don't like stories like I'm gonna use today, and the story I'm gonna use today, just to give you a jump to the end, a lot of people die, a lot of blood is shed, and uh, they're killed by the prophets and the people of God. And some people don't like that, and they say, well, you know, God's not loving if that happens in the Bible. I just think it's a message to us that sometimes we need to deal ruthlessly with the sin that attacks us. I think we're, I think we're a whole lot more uh, placating and pandering to sin than we ought to be in our culture. And uh, culture says the number, our, our American culture especially says the number one quality of a Christian is they're nice. You know, Mr. Rogers movie is out now and the whole Mr. Rogers thing is out. And I heard in a podcast and they were talking about it and, and they said that everybody loved Mr. Rogers. Did you know he was a Presbyterian minister? He was a minister in the Presbyterian church, but yet he never talked about Jesus and he never said anything that wasn't nice. And that's what our world tells us we're supposed to be as Christians. Don't ever talk about Jesus and don't ever do anything that isn't nice. So I'm going to ask you a question. Was Jesus nice the day he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan? How about this? Was Jesus nice when he looked at the, the crowd gathered and he says, you snakes, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs, you're full of dead men bones. Was that nice? How about when Jesus took a whip into the, the temple and he, he said, my father's house to be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of robbers and he took the whip. Why did he need a whip? Was he being nice in that moment? You see, maybe Jesus isn't always nice because sometimes situations in life don't call for nice. They actually call for somebody to have some guts to them. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not putting a coexist bumper sticker on my car because Buddha or Muhammad or all those others are going to bow their knee before Jesus because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It will happen. And I'm not going to pander now and say that niceness is my only opportunity because if you are running out in front of a car, one of your kids are, you don't want me to sit there and say, oh, you're, you're about to get hit. You want me to go tackle the kid and get them off the road. It's time for us to understand that niceness is not what we're called to, but truth is what we're called to. Some things are worth standing for. Martin Luther, you know, you know, Martin Luther, he was called to give an account before the diet of worms. Now I don't care what anybody says. It's just cool that they named it the diet of worms. I think I would have had problems with that place. Diet was a meeting, what they called a meeting of the high counselors. And it's not actually worms, it's verms in Greek. So, but it doesn't work out until you translate it in English, but still yet. Before the diet of worms, he was being called to account for uh, his teachings about salvation by grace and faith alone. And uh, he knew that if he did not recant, he would be, uh, he would be ostracized and there would be a, a 
a price put upon his life and he would be in danger of being martyred the rest of his life. And he knew that there was a death warrant if he didn't kowtow to the religious powers. But when they said to him, will you recant? He said, here I stand. I can do no other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. So help me God, amen. There comes a time to take a stand. So let's talk about the showdown at the Oak, at the Mount Carmel Corral today. We're going to, uh, in case you have to leave early, let me just tell you, the, the very simple message I'm going to deliver today is this, is there is a time when you have to take a stand. All right? So let's give the background to the story. First of all, uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, 1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, that's the prophet, he was from Tishbe in Gilead. And he said to Ahab, so Ahab is the king, and Ahab is a bad king. And if you do any research on it, you're going to find out that Ahab was a bad king because he was abusive to his people. He was dictatorial. He, uh, he mistreated people, and he led them away from God and worship of false idols. He was a bad king. And it said this, as soon as, uh, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain the next few years except at my word. You're talking about prophecies. Now, this is a prophecy. This isn't, oh, God's going to bless you. This is, it isn't going to rain until I say so. <laughs> That's pretty tough. So he stands up to Ahab and he says, it's not going to rain until I say so. So then we skip to chapter 18, our text where we're going to be reading today. 18, 1 says, after a long time, in the third year, so about three and a half years later, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. So here's what happens. I grew up as a kid in Oklahoma and there was a one summer I remember especially, it was incredibly dry. It was a drought. It didn't rain for a long time. It was a dry spring and it didn't rain more than once or twice all summer. And there were over 30 days of a hundred degree heat with no rain around August. And let me tell you that everything was dead. It hurt to walk barefooted on grass because it was so dry and brittle. It was like walking on briars. It was horrible. It was dry. All the farmers lost all their money because the crops all burned up. There was nothing and everything was dead. Leaves were falling off trees in the middle of summer. It was that dry. And that was one summer. Can you imagine repeating that for three years with no cycle of rain? Not only do you eat all of your food, but all of the food that you have to sow as a, as a seed for the next year to give you food for the following year is now dead. And not only that food is dead, but if you saved any for the third year, it's now dead and gone. There is nothing. And the famine was severe. We won't get into what all that means, but let's just say it was not pretty. So what happens? Year three. Elijah comes to Ahab to declare an end to the drought. And when he saw Elijah, Ahab, when Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now this line means a lot to me because this is something very simple. It's called projecting. Now what projecting is, is this, all right? I was, I was driving uh, about a year and a half ago. I was driving through Sam's Club parking lot over in Tiedemann. And as I was driving through a parking lot, I was actually in the lane going out to the road. And as I'm in the lane going out to the road from the gas station, somebody came whipping across and they came cutting across the lanes. I'm doing about 15, maybe 20 mile an hour. This guy was probably doing 30, 35. And I saw him coming. And if I hit my brakes or slowed down, he would have T-boned me square. Instead, I slammed on the gas. And when I slammed on the gas, he hit me on the back end and flipped us all the way around. And I, I get out of the car and, you know, I want to find out, is everybody okay? And when I step out of the car, I hear this guy yell, you are flying across the parking lot. I'm doing 15. You got me doubled and you're yelling at me. Actually, there were people who saw the wreck happen and they came over and said, when you call the cops, we'll testify. That dude was flying. Yet what did he say when he got out of the car? He blamed me for doing what he was doing. It's called projecting. He was doing what he was blaming me of. Now, none of you have ever seen this in your household. 
projecting. I get mad at you about what I'm actually doing wrong. And, and that what's going on here is Ahab had brought the problem to the nation. And he's saying that Elijah was the one that brought it. So verse 18, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. Sometimes I just have to tell you what the Bible says. The, uh, the prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel table, what were Asherah? Asherah was the, the goddess of fertility and she had been, the prophets of the goddess of fertility had been getting their food supply from the king while everybody else was starving. It's funny to me that the, the goddess of fertility is supposed to make crops grow. Do you, do you know how they worshipped Asherah? They had an Asherah pole, which was a huge phallic symbol that stood up that they bowed down before that had projections off of it. And as a part of their public worship, they would literally have sexual relations with the Asherah pole as a part of their worship. And you think you live in a messed up culture? Sometimes we think, oh, well, it's so bad. No, it ain't that bad yet. At least not on town square, they're not doing it yet. So what happens? We have a confrontation. The second part is a confrontation. The fight is not for Ahab, but for the people. We must understand that the fight for God isn't always about me. It's sometimes not even about those we're fighting against, but it's about the people who are watching the fight happen. Sometimes the steps of righteousness you need to take in your own household are not about you and they're not even about the, the forces you are fighting against, but they're about the kids who are watching whether or not you will follow God or whether you will follow what everybody else in the world does. Anyway, Elijah started the showdown with a and the purpose of the showdown was to confront the people, even though he was confronting the prophets of Baal. Uh, 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah went before the people and he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? You know what wavering between two opinions is? There's a guy who's coming to church here one time. And he had been coming for a while. And uh, he had also been attending another church. And he was coming here and attending another and coming here and attending another one. And I had a talk with him one day and I said, hey, I tell you what, why don't you go to the other church? Just go there all the time. Just go. Uh, stop coming here. Just go there. And I said that because I said, do you know, do you know what you're doing is you're, you're attending one church and attending another and you're sitting with, with on both sides of the fence. And you know what happens when you sit on a fence? It gives you a sore crotch. <laughs> why don't you get off the fence and why don't you make a decision one way or the other? Why don't you make a decision? Now, I, I would say this to you about many things in your life. Anytime you're always wavering between one opinion or the other, it's about time that you make up your mind. Pray, ask God, make a decision and go with it. All right. So what happens next? Well, the, if the Lord is God, you follow him. Hey, listen, if evolution is correct, do it. If there was no God involved at all, just blow it off. Just go. You know what? If drugs are really going to make you happy, just go do it. Really? They're going to make you happy? Just go do it. Go, go. Why, why are you pretending one thing and pretending another? Why not sell out to what you say you believe? Why this half-hearted devotion either way? Why not sell out? If God is God, if God is God, why don't you sell out to him and do it his way? All right? But the people, what they do? What they always do? They said nothing. I was talking to a pastor buddy of mine and uh, we were talking uh, Friday night and he, he was asked to leave a church he was part of and he was asked to leave a church and, and it's funny. Um, he said after he left there, people from the community and people from the church started writing him saying, we wish you would have stayed. We wish you would have stayed. We wish you would have stayed. He said, well, why didn't you say anything? I learned this lesson a long time ago. You ready for this? If you wait for public opinion, you will never do the right thing. 
If you wait until everybody tells you it's the right thing to do, you'll never do the right thing. You will regret a lot in your life if you don't take a stand. How long are you going to waver? When are you going to decide, you know what, I'm going to be a man or woman of God because I choose to be a man or woman of God, regardless of what anybody else says about it. So just when you do that, you're going to feel awfully alone. Elijah said to them, verse 22, I'm the only one of God's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Now, was he really the only one left? No. No, we find out a little later in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, we find out that God has still reserved for himself 7,000 people who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're never alone. You, you'll find out how much you're not alone when you make the right decision. And then he says, get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. And you will call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, you know, what you say is good. So what happens? Well, the prophets of Baal get to go first. There's so many of them. Elijah says to him, verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls, prepare it first since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and prepared it. And then they called out in the name of Baal from morning till noon. So about four or five hours, they've been there calling out to God, four hours. Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answer. And they danced around the altar they had made. Man, they were having a party. But in their party, who answered? No one. There was no answer. They got more louder and more frenzied. So at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. So about four hours into it. Now, I, I watch football. I, I, I like football. I, I will tell you this. I, I do. I like it. I do not like taunting, though. I don't like it. You know, if you catch a pass, you catch a pass and you score a touchdown, the proper response is to get up, nod your head, throw the football to the ref, run back to your sidelines, high-fiving your teammates. You know why? Because you act like you've been in a touchdown before. You know, I can't stand this. Oh, yeah, I'm down 35 to 7, but I make a big play and I get up and go, Ooh, ah, 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 ah. Dude, you've been scored on three times, but you make one play and you do that. Sorry. Do you know what the best bragging is? Scoreboard. You know, Jesus died, buried, and rose from the dead, and he's a soon-coming king. When he comes back, he's going to make it all right. When the devil comes to mess with you, what should you just say? We don't have to run around acting like a bunch of juveniles trying to be tough. You know why people brag so much? You know why people brag? Do you know? Be careful. Take note of what you boast about. Be careful what you boast about. When you boast, do you know what you do? You're actually showing where your insecurities lie. Oh, no, he did. Uh. Oh, yes, he did. Yeah, be careful. All right, so anyway, but you know what? Elijah, Elijah in this time does some appropriate taunting. He says, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely Baal is a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought. That sounds so nice. Perhaps he's deep in thought. I hate it when Bible translators do this to the scriptures. Do you know why? Do you know what this word is? This word is sayak. Now, sayak means he's taking a dump. Now, I'm, I'm sorry if it offends your sensibilities, but the fact of the matter is the Bible says what the Bible says. And he is making fun of them, saying he's gone to the bathroom and he can't answer you right now. Come on, this is funny. This is good smack talk now. Elijah would say, I don't smack talk, I smack talkers. Anyway. <clears throat> He's deep in thought or he's busy or he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So what happened? He's smack talking them a little bit. So how do they respond? Well, they, he gets under their skin. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom until their blood flowed. Can I talk a little bit about cutting? Can I just talk about this for a second? We're in a culture now that, um, I don't know, a lot of, it's sort of cool, I guess, to cut because your inner grief or whatever it is. Can I talk to you about this for a second? Cutting is never cool. Let me tell you why cutting is never cool. It hurts. 
It, it's, just, it's just not cool. The reason it's not cool is the thief, the Bible says about the devil that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God says he comes that you may have life and have it to the full. And when you find these cutting things, the, 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 if you ever have this desire, listen, I'm not condemning. I'm just talking to you about the motivation. Listen, to me. the motivation to want to hurt yourself is a motivation that does not come from the God who gives you life and hope and blessings and a future. It doesn't come from him. It comes from those who want to destroy you. So if you have that temptation, would you ask God, would you maybe do this? Ready? Would you maybe fall on your knees in this moment and say, Jesus, would you give me your life instead of me living under the temptation and oppression of the devil? Try it. Try it. Just maybe try it. You know what? It's not from God. Don't do it. There's life. And, and by the way, every time you find cutting in the Bible like that, you're going to find it attached to satanic and demonic worship. Stay away from it. Don't even, don't even go there. So if you're tempted to do it, come on, let's get out of that. Let's move into a healthy place. Let's move out of that into a healthy place, okay? So then he says, um, they were cutting themselves with swords and spears as with their custom until the blood flows. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the evening sacrifice. Frantic prophesying, wow. Until the evening sacrifice, which is about four o'clock in the afternoon, I believe. About four in the afternoon. So these people have been at it eight hours. Listen, they were sincere. They had, been, they had been doing this for eight hours and it didn't work after eight hours. You know, you can be sincerely wrong. And just because you're sincere doesn't mean that it's the right thing to be sincere for. And they had kept it up for eight hours. And it didn't work, but there was no response. No one answered. No one even paid attention. No one paid attention. Now it's Elijah's turn. What does he do? He starts repairing the altar of God. It, uh, First Kings chapter 18, 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here. And they came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord. What had happened in this time period is worship to God had stopped. And instead of worship, there was only now a pursuit of selfish interests and, and spirits other than God. And, and the first thing he did was repair worship to God. He repaired the altar of God. And what is an altar? An altar is a place where you present sacrifices. I was standing this morning thinking as we were singing that song, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. As I was hearing that song and singing that song, I was thinking about what we are called to do with our lives is to worship God with all of our lives. And where we need to start in those moments when things are broken is with a recognition of the greatness and mercy and love of God and worship him. And that is the starting point to healing, restoration, and bringing our lives back into alignment with God's purposes. So he started with repairing the altar, which had been torn down. And then after that, he took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of flour. That, that's about 4.5 gallons, just under five gallons. And he arranged the wood and he cut the bull into pieces and, uh, and he laid it on the wood. And then he said to him, fill four large jugs with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Now, what, hold on, wait, wait. We're in the middle of a drought. People have been prophesying and running around cutting themselves eight hours, nine hours. And there's all this craziness going on, the heat and the drought. And they had some drinking water with them and they were using up all their drinking water. So what Elijah is doing is he's taking what they actually had and he's pouring not only a bull, but he's pouring their lives in the middle of a drought onto the fire. By the way, when you put water onto things, onto wood, does it make it burn better? Okay, so what happened is he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, laid it on the wood. Then he said, I'm fill four large jugs with water and poured on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. They did it a third time, and the water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. So we got five gallons of water or more laying around this now. 
And then Elijah prayed a very short but powerful prayer. And by the way, can I talk about prayer for a second? Some of you think you got to change your voice when you pray. Would you please stop that? Please, I beg you, I beg you. Elijah did not stand up and say, Oh, Lord, most holy God, we beseech thee now on behalf of all thy blessings and bountiful mercies that thou have poured upon us in ages past. Come on, that's silly. Come on. If you wouldn't talk to anybody else in your life that way, don't talk to God that way, please. Because you start talking like that, he's like, who is that? <laughs> so what did he do? 1 Kings 18, 36. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant. I've done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. He may have raised his voice there. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you're turning their hearts back again. You know, the great thing about this prayer is it's simple. And it tells us why he's praying it. He's not praying it so he can be powerful. He's praying it so people can be turned back to God. James 5, 17 says Elijah was a human being just like us. New Testament writer said Elijah was a man just like us. Even as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed again, the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. What he's saying here is this. God heard the simple prayer of Elijah. God like, likes to hear the simple prayer of his people. So what happens? There's a dramatic win. I love the dramatic win. It's almost as good as the Ohio State win last night. Then the, and if you don't like that, you might be in the wrong church. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just, just joking with you. We can joke, right? All right. Then the fire of the Lord fell. The fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones and the soil and licked up the water in the trench. Can you imagine this fire? How hot and ferocious it had to be. Fire of God came down, took care of all of this. And when the people saw this, they fell prostrate. Duh. Right? Wouldn't you like, uh, wouldn't you have a reaction? They fell prostrate and declared, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Remember, it was a showdown. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. So, what's the results? There are two results, real fast. Uh, 1840 said, Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley, and they slaughtered them there. They dealt with the forces that had been leading them astray and destroying them. And then the second thing that happened was 1845. Meanwhile, the sky blue grew black with clouds. The wind rose and a heavy rain started falling. Started falling. God brought restoration to the land because he was declared Lord. All right. So y'all give me 10 minutes. I'm going to try to wrap all this up. You ready? So have you decided what side you're going to be on? I believe that this generation of the church, specifically this generation of the church, is facing a showdown moment. The church is either going angry, crazy, nuts, or cowardly, silent. It seems there's no middle ground. And I believe the angry, crazy, nuts is not according to God's best. I don't believe you can love somebody and go angry, crazy, nuts on them. But I also do not believe you can love appropriately this culture while you sit in cowardly silence. Sin is still sin. God is still right. It doesn't even matter if it hurts your feelings. I'm going to say that again. Sin is still sin. God is still right. And it doesn't matter if you get your feelings hurt. You might get your widow feelings hurt. I'm not mocking you much. <laughs> but listen, we live in an outraged generation and everybody's got to be outraged about everything. But you know what? You don't have to be outraged about anything. You can get your feelings hurt by people who love you because they're telling you the truth. Like my wife did to me at the end of first service today. <laughs> Just because somebody tells you you're wrong, it doesn't mean that they hate you. They might actually love you. But at some point, we're going to have to decide 
which side we're on. Are we on the side of God? Are we on the side of culture? Are we on the side of pursuing God with all of our heart or our comfort with all of our heart? As crazy as our culture is, it's really no different than the culture of the Bible. You know, ancient pagan religions had no morality attached to their religious beliefs. When the Bible was written, ancient pagan religions did not attach morality to their religious views. They just didn't do it. It, religion was about multi, uh, uh, manipulating the gods to get what you wanted. It wasn't about you doing anything moral. So ancient pagan religions had no r morality attached to them. So when Christianity showed up with a moral code, that's the reason Christianity made inroads into a culture that had no morality. We should learn a lesson from our early brothers. In fact, morality was the thing that drew people into Christianity. Why? I'll give you one example. In ancient Rome and Greece, it was actually preferred by full-grown men to have sex with little boys than it was to have sex with women. That was the culture to which the Bible was written, is that 50-year-old men preferred raping seven, eight-year-old boys over having sex with their wives. There was no morality attached to that. It was just what the culture said was okay. As a matter of fact, those were slaves that were called pedos, and they were bought by the men so that they could raise them up to be their items of molestation. By the way, this happens around the world. In countries like India, where they sell nine and 10 year old girls to work in sex slave markets and they're raised for that purpose. Because morality attached to Christianity seems to be the only culture that has ever really attached morality to our belief in God. Anyway, don't get me started. You know, in the, after World War II, Nazi scientists were condemned for performing sex change operations, and they were called war crimes for doing sex change operations on adults. But a month or so ago, a mother down in Texas was awarded full custody of a boy that she is trying to have sexually changed into a girl at the age of seven. This is child abuse. If you say it isn't child abuse, or you have no problem forcing a seven-year-old child that doesn't know the difference really between carbs and vegetables, how can you choose whether you want a penis or a vagina if you don't know the difference between broccoli and potatoes? If you don't understand what it means to take a bath and why you should do it, how can you decide such things? You can't. And anyone that doesn't see a problem with forcing a child to undergo sex change operation is incredibly un uninformed about the physical harm that is brought about to a physical body by stopping puberty and preventing it from happening let alone the social, the emotional. Either they're uninformed or they're delusional. Do you know what delusional is? Delusional is a person that clings to false belief even if, she, if he or she is confronted with evidence, facts, and proof that refutes their false belief because it's based on a false view of reality. That's like this lady, one of our, our um, superstars of culture said, the parent answered on his television show, every morning, first thing I do is go into my son's bedroom, sit on the side of his bed and greet him. And I ask him, tell me, sweetheart, what do you feel like today? Do you feel more like a little boy or a little girl today? That is delusional. I won't read the rest of it. It just makes me mad. I don't want to get mad. I just want to talk truth. Either you're uninformed, you're delusional, or you're just plain evil. And this whole thing in our culture about sex changing and all this kind of stuff, that we're doing it. Oh boy, I, I, I have rabbit trails. I understand the arguments. I have read them. I've been immersed in them for years. I understand them. Let me tell you, there is no argument to support the changing of a seven-year-old boy into a girl. It is child abuse. 
If you disagree with that, then we should really, really have a talk. And if you think it's okay, you have a problem. You would probably say, it's okay to rape seven-year-old boys in ancient Greece. Do you know where that comes from? It comes from, we're taught that since you are evolutionary creatures, evolutionary creatures have no morality. There is no morals. If you believe in evolution, you have to throw away morality. I'm not saying theistic evolution. I'm talking about the secular model of evolution. If you buy that, you have to throw morality away. You have to say there is no right or wrong. The reason you have to say that is because then all rights or wrongs are socially induced and they're an evolutionary process formed by cultures. So what you have to say is if you buy that way of thinking, just listen, this is what your teachers, I know this is what your teachers are telling you, but if you actually buy what they're telling you, you have to then say it was because it was socially okay for them to, for, for, 60-year-old men to rape seven-year-old boys in ancient Greece because it was socially acceptable, you have to say that is morally acceptable. And if you say that is morally acceptable, then you have a problem. Are, are, are we listening? Maybe I'll just preach to the choir. Maybe I'll just talk to you for a second. Listen. I, do, you, do you realize no matter where you go in the world, you may think killing is okay until you're the one being killed by someone. And then it's not okay with you, right? I don't care how much you defend murder, it's not okay if you're the one that you're being killed when you want to continue to live life, right? Oh, adultery's okay. Sex with another person, adultery, it's okay. There's no rules against that until it is the person you love deeply that is being stolen away from you and you are left with a broken heart and then you don't think adultery is okay. Right? Stealing is okay. There are cultures, I've heard this argument. There are cultures where stealing is, is looked at as a moral virtue. Yeah, until your food supply and all you have to live on and all your kids have to live on is stolen. And then it's not a moral virtue. Are y'all following me? Do you know what I've declared for you? I've declared for you three moral laws that are universal. They are not related to culture. They're related to truth simply because they are true. Do you know if you buy any of those things, any of them, any of them, that seven-year-olds should not be molested by 60-year-old men? that a child should not, it, anyway, you buy any of those, do you know what you're saying? You're declaring that you believe there is a moral law that supersedes all other cultural laws. And as soon as you do that, do you know what you just recognized in your own heart? You believe there is a moral law giver. And that moral lawgiver tells you what's right and wrong. And it doesn't matter what culture says about it because you serve a moral lawgiver who tells you what's right and wrong, regardless of what culture says. This moral law is not an evolutionary construct. I understand nature versus nurture. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about God says it's right because God says it's right. And God says it's wrong because God says it's wrong. And you know in your heart that God is right and God declares it. It's based on a higher authority. And if you break this divine law, you are culpable. No matter how sincerely you fight against it, you are still culpable. You are guilty. So believers, let me speak to you for a second. That's the reason I made these arguments. Believers, it is, mo it is morally reprehensible for you to believe that someone will be judged by the divine law of God and you see them breaking it and you don't try to stop them. If the house is on fire and you walk past the house on fire and you know there are people inside the house and you look at the house and say, mm, somebody ought to do something, those poor people are going to die. You, my friends, have violated your own moral code in that moment. And if you watch somebody whose life is entrenched in sin and you do or say nothing to help them get out, you are culpable for their blood. It is morally reprehensible to do nothing, to say nothing, or be 
passive. Uh, do you remember this guy named Robert Courtney? He was a, a pharmacist, and he was convicted of diluting the medication of cancer patients in order to make a profit. Over a period of about nine years, he diluted an ex estimated 98,000 prescriptions of medications affecting some 4,200 patients. At least 17 cancer patients died after receiving diluted formulation of chemotherapy. He made $19 million from the fraud and was sentenced to 30 years in prison for not giving the full measure of what he should given as a pharmacist. And you as a Christian, you do not have a right to give only half of the gospel. Yes, God is love, but God is also a God of justice. Both are true. You will be culpable if you do not share both sides of the truth. Let me conclude by declaring, oh, and by the way, if you do that, you're going to suffer persecution. I've raised three kids in the public schools, and they've come home and told me the stories about how when they take a stand for what is right and say what is wrong is wrong and what is right is right, how they're made fun of, they're attacked, they're given lower grades, their papers, one of them, their paper wasn't allowed to be submitted. Come on. It doesn't matter. If you take a stand for what is right, you have God on your side. You don't need the world on your side. They're all going to do all right if you take a stand for what is right. And if you die, you die like Jesus did. You die like Stephen did. You die like James the Apostle did. You die like the other 11 apostles did. What if you die? What if God calls you to take a moral stand and it costs you something? What? Would you rather suffer a little bit here on earth and have eternity with God or would... Or do you not even believe in heaven? It's about time we embrace the fact that we have eternity with a loving Jesus and every tear will be wiped from our eye and every blessing will be given for eternity and that is my future and 60 or 70 years on this earth does not compare to 60 billion in eternity with him. Why are you living like a stupid pauper? Why are you living poor? Why are you living scared? The reason you are is because you're afraid of what it might cost you. Stop, rebuild the altar first and put yourself on it. Amen. So let me land the plane. I'm going to conclude. I'm going to declare that no matter where you stand on this, God loves you. No matter where you live, God loves you. No matter what you do, God loves you. He does love you. And he wants you to repent. And here's the deal that's the truth as well. If you don't repent, eternity hangs in the balance. Anybody ever go to the airport and try to get through security but forget your boarding pass? If you do it once, you won't do it twice because you wait in that five-mile line of security and you get up there and what happens? Where's your boarding pass? Did, what do they say to you in that moment? Oh, I know you, I know you had good intentions. Just go on through. Is that what they say? No. What do they say? You, you may miss your flight, but you got to go back and get a boarding pass, right? So it is when you want to get into heaven, if you want to get into heaven, I don't care what your good intentions are, how much you hung out at the airport, how much you hung out at church, unless you've repented and given your heart to Jesus, you're not going. All right, that's the first thing I say. And the second thing is this, choose a side today. Choose a side today. If you say, I'm not going to give an answer, you did. You gave an answer. The answer is no. I'm now talking to those of you that are believers. Are you going to go all in or are you going to continue this sort of namby-pamby? Well, you know, I'll only do it if it doesn't cost me anything. Are you going to step up and live for Jesus? Listen, I feel a responsibility to raise up a Daniel, a Shadrach, and a Meshach generation. I'm not in this to raise up a generation of namby-pamby wimps. We want to raise up a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego generation that will take a stand and say, even if God does not come through, we still will not bow our knee to this culture and to this world. Would you stand with me? I want to ask you a question. If you're uh, prayer teams, come on out, move forward, come now. If you're in this place today and it's your day to make a commitment, get off the fence. It's your day to follow Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you, would you bow your heads with me real quick? I do want to respect a little bit and give you an opportunity to make a personal decision. 
If it's your day to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ with all your heart and you want to commit to him and make him the Lord and Savior of your life, I'd like you to raise your hand. I'd like to pray with you. Raise your hand. Yes. There are others? Yes. There are others in the room? Yes. Around this room, there are hands going up. Yes. Yes. Nobody prays alone. Can we all pray together today, right now? Dear Jesus, I go all in. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my future. I give you my hopes and dreams. Be my Lord. I will serve you. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for receiving me. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, guess what just happened today? Jesus heard your prayer. You are saved. Now, start living like it. Hey, if you want somebody to pray with you today about any part of your life, we have prayer teams up here. We're going to sing this song again to end. I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you because I went a little long today, but I knew I would because I had four and a half pages of notes. I didn't care. Some days, you just got to declare, right? All right? Jesus, I pray that your people would walk out of this place today resolved to follow you and to serve you with all their heart. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Amen. God bless you.